Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Okay, so today on the Plant Cunning Podcast, we have Paul Resendez, and Paul is one of the most interesting fellows that I have met. Uh, he started out as a uh, a motorcycle gang leader, became a <laughs> yoga teacher, and was a truck driver and a wild tracking a, a wildlife tracking expert and teacher for many many decades. Operated a school, um, and is a photographer, a wildlife photographer. Has been out in very remote areas, fighting bears, uh, doing all sorts of <laughs> stuff like that. So, uh, Paul, how are you today? Oh, fine. You know, I, I did have a cold, but looks like we're okay. That's good. good. Yeah, it, it is It is the season, uh, as they yep. say. Yeah. say. So, um, I first uh, met you through the TAT organization, uh, Truth and Transmission, and we've had interviewed some other folks like Art Arna uh We interviewed Norio as well this summer, uh, who, who's a friend of yours. Yep. Um, and what I what I like to ask folks in, uh, when we're talking about these sorts of things uh, is a question that Richard Rose would ask people when he first met them, and that is, uh, what do you know for sure? Absolutely nothing. That's a short and quick answer. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's really, it seems to me to be very important. Once you're sure about something, you get locked in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, but if you stay open and you keep asking and testing and probing and investigating and exploring, then that lotus is just going to keep opening up. Otherwise, when you dig in, you think you got it. You're just stuck there. That's where you're going to be. Hmm. So what about the question, uh, what are you? Well, the way I would answer that is everything that ever happened is showing up as this now. There's no way to separate this person, these words, from everything that's ever happened. Mm. These words are showing up as that. We can't go in there and just separate When you start pulling on any one thing, something you think is a thing, when you start pulling on that, what you think is a separate thing, you start pulling on it and pulling on it, before you know it, you find out it's entangled to the whole universe. So so as well, you're showing up. The universe is showing up as you. The universe is showing up as us getting together here. We can't separate ourselves from it all. Mm-hmm. So what about whatever is witnessing or aware of th- what's happening? Okay. What's aware of what's happening? <clears throat> I could easily say it's the same thing. But let me clarify that, okay? Because in the non-dual community, it's usually, it's often, I shouldn't say usually, but it's often thought of in these terms. And some people will take a TV screen for an example Mm -hmm. and say um, the screen, which represents awareness, or the eternal is not the movie. It's not affected, at least it's not affected by what's going on in the movie. There's all kinds of violence sometimes in the movie, there's pleasure, there's, you know, the whole thing, right? But the screen is unaffected. 
but you can't have the movie without the screen. It's like there's all this coming and going in something that's not coming and going. So that's the basic, to me, sometimes non-dual perspective. But, and I was there for, I, I saw it that way myself for many, for a few decades, or maybe even more. But remember how we were saying about keep questioning, mm -hmm. remain open, mm -hmm. settle on anything. Because of that, what happened here is what, what I found was what is coming and going is not separate from what is not coming and going. The what is not coming and going is the coming and going. So the coming and going, the not coming and going are really not separate. They're into being. You can't separate them and say, I'm what's not coming and going. I'm just the awareness, the eternal. I'm not the impermanent. But the impermanent in the so-called permanent is interbeing. You, they arise together. Mm -hmm. This is hard for the mind to grasp because it it can't think in terms of eternal for one thing or no time. We tend to think that the eternal, that which is not coming and going, has always been there and will always be there. You've heard that before, I'm sure. Yeah. But form is impermanent. It, it just, and if you take the form away, the awareness is still there. That's the general way people perceive this. But I'm not so sure about that anymore. Well, it would seem to me that you would have to have, to know that, to know that you would have to experience awareness without an object of consciousness. Right. And some people say they experience that. But when people say they experience that, you're talking about experiencing something that's not an experience. So I have a problem with that. Okay, so you're talking about all experiences arising in what they're calling a non-experience, right? They're calling it a non-experience and then they go experience it. You see what I'm saying? So I, right. I have a bit of a problem with that. What I'm trying to say is, if there's no time, if everything is really eternal, mm -hmm. right, then there's there's all these creation stories. There's no beginning and there's no end. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. They're mutually arising into being. It's always been that way and it will always be that way. We tend to separate them out and make creation stories out of no time. <laughs> See what I'm saying? But I get into trouble here with the non-dual community sometimes. <laughs> well, I think that's healthy. <laughs> I think everybody sees, I mean, as, uh, as far as all the people who I've listened to have found something more uh genuinely found something they all seem to have their own language for describing it and yeah, yeah that's true and have different experiences and they're different personalities mm -hmm. and maybe at this point it would be helpful to back up a little bit and talk about paul resendez as the the person mm. yeah. yeah i'm curious how um you changed your lifestyle from a um motorcycle crew to a yoga teacher you sure you want to go into that? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm curious. I want to know a little bit about your past. Yeah, well, I don't have a, that good of a memory. Never had a good memory. But I remember sitting in the courtroom and looking at the judge and he told me, I pronounce you guilty. And I sentenced you to five to 10 years in Walpole State Prison. Time stopped. Right. There was no way I'm a real nature boy. Yeah. I spent all my time in the forest. Mm -hmm. I could not see myself in prison. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't even see myself with four walls around me for a while. What seemed to be an eternity, he finally said, sentence suspended three years probation. That was my chance to get away from the clubs. And I was ready. I was yeah. wanting to find a way out because it was getting pretty crazy. I mean, I was the leader of a motorcycle gang, and then I was the leader of a chapter of the Devil's Disciples, the Fall River chapter. And they were one of the most notorious clubs on the East Coast. And uh, there was bullets flying around, and we were... So that's one thing that made you change. But we were at war with one uh, another local uh, one percent of club. And the other thing that really made me want to change things and was part of my being in court, the reason why I was being in court, when, when I was married to my first wife in those days, I had two kids. I had an apartment in Westport, Massachusetts. And I woke up in the middle of the night and somebody was breaking my door down. And uh, my wife was screaming and screaming. I had a loaded 357 Magnum in my drawer. And I was running for it. And I figured it was a, a local club that was breaking in. And I was going to fire some shots over the head, and they'd be gone pretty quick. My bedroom door busted open, and it was the state police. And I was reaching for a three fifty seven Magnum, which I didn't have in my hands yet. I had my hands on the drawer and was opening. Lucky. So if I had that in my hand, mm -hmm. I would have been dead so fast. Right. You can't imagine how many... Uh, High-powered weapons were pointing at me at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was in court. And those two things really made, you know, you got to, at some point you get to a place in your life where you really have to ask yourself, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. What is my life about? What is this all about? Hmm. And there's a real sincere wanting to understand, wanting to just get it. Like, how did I get here? You know? Yeah. And then there's some real soul searching that starts. And then there's sometimes, but see, all your life, you realize you've been avoiding pain and seeking pleasure, right? So when that happens and you start asking serious questions, one of the questions you start to ask, at least I did, is that all that life's about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain? Well, it must be about spiritual or religious or, you know, my whole family was very religious, brought up Catholic and stuff. 
And I wanted to get back to that. And I, I went, I done all kinds of crazy things to get back into my religion as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm getting to a point here. And I was married to a divorced woman, so I couldn't take the sacraments. And I wanted to take the sacraments. I wanted to get back to God, you know? So I went and see a saint, Catholic saint. And she told me that I had to write the Pope and ask for an annulment. And then if I really, really was sincere, it would be granted. Well, I took a vow of celibacy for a whole year, which was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, and I would go to the, uh, I forget the name of the place, but it was a place where they had all the stations of a cross and you would crawl on your knees through all the stations and pray. I did that constantly. Mm -hmm. Right, waiting, expecting an answer from the Pope, giving me an annulment because all I wanted him was to be a Catholic and do the right thing. Answer came back, no. So now, you know, here I am back again. Now I want to know the truth. I don't care about pleasure and pain anymore. I don't care what the truth is. Is there a God or isn't there a God? I mean, they taught all my life to believe in God. Mm -hmm. But am I believing in God just because that's what I've been taught? What's the truth here? I don't care what the truth is. I just, I don't care if it's not what I want it to be or it's what I want it to be. I just want to know what it is. Right. So look, something important happens here with me. At the time, they don't understand it. But the energy of self, the energy that is bound up in self, which is in the tissue of the brain, right? That energy all of a sudden is moving as the passion for truth. Right now, there's no self-concern. There's no self-interest. That energy has transformed into an energy-seeking truth. That energy is openness. It's mm -hmm. totally open. It doesn't want anything to be any certain way. Mm -hmm. Just what's the truth then doors open right so that i think is i mean see seeking to be back into religion was seeking more pleasure and avoiding pain mm -hmm. seeking mm -hmm. enlightenment is seeking pleasure and avoiding pain i'm yeah. done at some point, that gets frustrated, and it just comes down to what's true here. Yeah. And that's when doors start to open. Yeah, not being attached to a certain outcome, but just being ready for whatever that, that outcome is. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And once there's an awakening to, say, the false self, and you think, oh, yeah, that's what they're all talking about. That's it. There's still an openness there. It doesn't latch on to anything. Now, in some cases, for a lot of people, it does. That's what they know for sure. And that's okay. They're in a good place. They're, they're in an awake place. A lot of the inner conflict is resolved. And that in the conflict is expressing itself outwardly in the world. You can see it out there now. And that's no longer expressing itself outwardly in the world. So that's a good place to be. But on the other hand, if you stay open, 
and keep questioning and probing and that passion for truth just keeps burning mm -hmm. then the lotus just keeps opening that's what I was trying to explain yeah mm -hmm. But do you have any, so what uh, choice or ability to change, like how, can you make the passion for truth start burning? Well, that I might suggest that that which wants to make the passion for truth start burning is self-concern. So the energy of self is still there in the effort to get the passion for truth. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So that's called direct pointing. So a lot of the people will help you along the path, and some teachers will just directly point constantly hoping that someone will see what they're pointing to. They're just pointing to the veil or this self-concern. But that's not what we want to see. <laughs> we want to see progress. Because there's self-concern. Mm -hmm. Also seems like there's especially in the the place the of self concern the the mind always going over all of these worries in the world and like wanting to become this or become that or progress um there's that's like to the way i from my my perspective that's kind of like an epiphenomenon and like there's like a deeper level of um what you really want and like what is moving you that you're maybe not as conscious of all the time um but that is like where the actual where our direction actually happens <laughs> mm. yeah oh, oh, okay and that's what we're saying isaac is that um when there's that passion for truth, yeah, sometimes it's not recognized, but that is moving us at the same time. We don't recognize that there's no uh, self-concern and we're being pushed and we're being like there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of exploring and investigating. And often or sometimes that's the passion for truth it isn't self-concern but self-concern will come in to try to figure out which it is yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah it, it, i mean it's trying to continue to identify and like that. take take thing as my, this is mine this is this is my seeking this is my uh mm -hmm. progression this is you know right yeah but the passion for truth doesn't care about progression or feeling good, right? It's just, what's the truth? Mm -hmm. Is you know? truth synonymous with enlightenment for you, Paul? Or what is enlightenment exactly? Oh, you're going to open a can of worms, but that's okay. <laughs> that's just, why we're here. Well, I mean, I have two videos on that. Well, two videos on what does it mean to be awake. Okay. So, so this is how I see it. And I think I've heard Ardhya Shanti talk about this in very similar ways. So if we can, we need to back up and take a look at what's happening in the psyche, right? So and this is just a suggestion. It's not to be taken intellectually as truth or untruth. It's to be explored and questioned. Okay, so everything I'm saying is meant for exploration. So the way it seems to me is thought has created this idea thousands of years ago 
I'm thinking the thoughts. There is a thinker of the thoughts, which needs, which is obviously separate from the thoughts. It has control over the thoughts. This thinker thinks it has coalition of choice and free will. It needs control. Control is all important to it. And it believes in itself. There's a belief system there, the mother of all belief systems. It believes in the self that thinks, is intelligent, has awareness, and can observe itself. So that's all set up. Let's say that it's an assumption created by thought that we all inherit. The whole universe, through all our cultures, through all our inheritance, through everything that's ever happened, is showing up as that as well as anything else. And then that assumption tries to get back to wholeness or it tries to observe thought. So, so now what happens when that assumption is trying to observe thought? It thinks it can observe, but it the assumption is the thinker doesn't understand that it is created by thought. It is thought. Thought trying to examine thought. The conditioned trying to examine the condition. As it does that, it divides itself. And it can't see the whole picture. It can't see the whole. It's divided, right? When there's a seeing that, then there is an understanding coming into view that self is blind. It doesn't have the volition that it thought it had. It is not who it thinks it is. The whole belief system in that structure falls away but something else has come in. One can't see what has come in, but it is seeing, it is awareness, it has revealed the faults. And there's no denying what it revealed. Thus, the self can no longer deny that it is not aware. Something else is aware of it. And that is the wholeness that everything is appearing in. Just like the false self appeared in that, all form is appearing in that. Okay, so there's an awakening there. But the false self is embedded in the tissue of the brain, right? And the brain is very, very malleable. You just take hearing, for instance. If you lose your hearing of, uh, say, high frequencies, and you don't get hearing aids, sooner or later, that part of the brain that it interprets the high frequencies will atrophy. And even if you get hearing aids, you won't be able to hear the high frequencies anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing. When there's an awakening, the self-concern is still in the tissue of the brain. And when certain buttons are pushed, the brain's going to respond. Mm -hmm. And, but if the person is awake enough, if the person not awake enough, the person's going to go, I can't believe I'm angry. Yeah. Never had an awakening. See? And then that's engaged. 
the, that part of the brain is still being engaged. It can't atrophy. But if the awakening is powerful enough, there's going to be real chuckle and a realization that, oh, the brain is just knee-jerk reactions, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's nobody there with volition anymore that can do anything about it. There's just openness to it. And th that openness is letting it be as it is. It's not engaging it. And as it's not engaged, that tissue will atrophy. If it's not used, it will atrophy. When it pretty much mostly atrophies, then we can say that the new perspective or awareness is embodied now. That it's actually changed the tissue of the brain. And that's not responding anymore. I'm not beating myself up anymore. I'm not angry with myself anymore. I'm not angry with my wife anymore. That's enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's what that's how I use the term. Okay. Yeah. So but enlightenment comes, matures kind of from awakening. Uh -huh. So that's just how I use the terms. People are going to use those terms in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about and I, I I would like to talk about uh being in the wild too and like because mm. you, you you mentioned that you were always a nature boy even when you were in a motorcycle gang mm -hmm. that was very important so uh what what has that journey been like um so you've always been out in nature and do you think that's an integral part of your spiritual path and because because in the circles that i've run in like a lot of people actually are out in nature a lot, but it's not something that is really talked about as important. But even like Richard Rose was was out in, in his farm in, in West Virginia for years, you know, um, and he recommended people to be to do isolations and be have time alone. And that's something that you can really get um, being out there. And you've been to some pretty re remote places. <laughs> so, yeah, what, what's your experience with that? Well, let's back up a little bit again so we can get a view here of that. Um, okay. So my wife and I ran a nature school, mostly a tracking school. We had anywhere from 12 to 15 instructors teaching for us at any time. We had two people in the office here. I'm in my office now. We down, downgraded a lot, just me and Paulette now. And we don't have the nature school anymore. But we used to have a school where it was we would bring people with, to an intimacy with, with nature. And we called that the outer landscape. So if you spend enough time in nature, really studying nature and observing nature, what you will come to is the interbeing of the outer landscape. Eventually, you'll see that everything is connected in a very visceral way. It's not, you're not just learning it by reading about it, everything is connected. You're seeing that it's all connected. You watch a deer come into the world in the forest and you realize that deer has come, that deer is the forest. The forest is becoming that deer. And when that deer dies, you can watch it disperse right back into the forest. So there's an intimacy there with the outer landscape and into being. And, and that's really important. But what happens is, like uh, Paulette and I used to hang out with these extreme extreme environmentalist. And I'm not going to mention any names, but you would recognize their affiliations if I said it. And they some of those guys <laughs> went to jail for, you know, screwing up bulldozers and stuff like that. And they were very intimate with the outer landscape. But there wasn't an intimacy with the inner landscape. So in the outer landscape, they saw no division. 
but inwardly there was still division. It's and and they seen people as really bad, you know, and and it, they felt like if all the people died in the world, there was some big disease, would be best for the world, you know. So there was no compassion for people. Just compassion for, they could not separate themselves from the outer landscape. They seen themselves as that outer landscape. What was happening to the animals and the plants and the river and the mountains was happening to them. And they were hurt by all that because they had compassion, right? Well, when you go inwardly and you do your inner exploration inwardly, and we used to call the inner tracking, tracking the self. And when there's, there's an intimacy as intimate with the inner landscape as there is with the outer landscape, then all divisions have gone. And you realize that human beings are like they are through no fault of their own. It's just the way the universe is showing up in them. They're programmed. They don't know to do anything else. And then there's compassion for them as well as for the environment. There's compassion for everyone. I don't know if I veered off your question or not. No, I think that's that's very important. And one of the things that I've I've been that's been going on in my mind in terms of um the non-separation of interconnectedness of the outer landscape is how, I mean, humans are part of nature, you know, and cities are part of nature. I would prefer to be in the woods <laughs> than in the city, in the cities though. Uh, but there is a, 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 a stillness and a silence that you get when you're, you know, deep in the woods or on a river or something like that, where, it seems as though it's easier to access the inner landscape too. And have you found that for people as you've, <coughs> as you've worked with, with people in, because when you're, you're, you're saying that as you were training people to track in the outer landscape, you are also working on the inner landscape too. If, and if people were um, open to it, hmm. So do you think there is something about being in nature itself that helps with that process? Or is it just, I mean, maybe it's it's just individual, like for certain people, it's more helpful. Uh, you know, I talked to uh, Sean, who we both, yeah. both, all three of us know him. Uh, and he felt the same I did. Somehow, being in nature, I don't know if I want to use the word important, but when, when you go to nature, you're going to your essence, to your roots. And, you know, the Japanese have this term forest bathing. Mm. Yeah. And, and uh, it's, they do these practices where they just find a sit spot in the woods someplace. They go there and just really immerse themselves in nature and really just take the sounds and smells. And, and they've studied that. They studied the effect it has on the body. And it does have, a it actually lowers people's blood pressure. Hmm. And it does have health giving effects to be in nature. And even the smells of the pines and things like that can change your um, uh, your state of mind. So being in nature, back to your roots, to me, really 
is healthy and does something very positive, mm -hmm. I think it's, well, look at what happens to us. Yeah. I mean, look at this room that you're in. Look at the room you're in. Look at, I can look around to the room I'm in, you know, and it's all products of thought. Rejected outwardly. Mm. We're surrounding ourselves by thought. Put yourselves in the middle of Manhattan. Mm. You're surrounded miles of thought. And, and we're all stuck there. And at the moment, it's, it's kind of like, remove yourself, please. Go into the forest. Go into the desert. Go to sea. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that, I, I just think it has a positive effect. I'm not telling people they do that. They'll, they'll have an awakening. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I think a lot of our listeners find and like I, you know, I have always felt like being in in the woods and in in nature has as a as a sacred experience. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Whether or not it directly helps with uh, realization, <laughs> I think it. I think it does to. I mean, it helps. Well, think of it this way. Um, here we are using the mind. Um, when you have a real visceral understanding of the interconnectedness and the interbeing and the intercreating outwardly, it's not that far away from being totally interconnected. Yeah. There are just some pieces missing there some more pieces that need to fall into place, but the rest has already fallen into place. And I think there's another thing about like what you were talking about in terms of being in the middle of Manhattan, there's thought everywhere. It's all products of thought. We're also bombarded with other people's thoughts and messages and advertisements. And it's hard to get a track on our, our own voice, our own inner voice and our own inner voices <laughs> and that's okay. that's something that that being out in nature where there aren't you're not bombarded with all of these other people's thoughts can be helpful to to find your own <laughs> your own thoughts well is there my own thought well yeah let's look at that okay yeah that's a fair point okay so a thought comes in I think the most fascinating thing to do in self-exploration is watching your thoughts. It's amazing what you can, can learn. Where's that thought come from? This is going to sound very familiar now. We're going to start to get redundant. Where's that thought coming from? Can you take that one single thought that you think is your personal thought you start to pull on it if you can take it, if you could grab it hold of it and start to yank and pull on it what are you going to find out you're going to find out that it's connected to the whole universe that thought could have never come into being without all your ancestors without all your animal ancestors without everything that ever happened is appearing now as that thought. That's the earth. It's the sun. It's the air. It's the oxygen. It's the minerals in the soil. That thought is the whole universe appearing. Okay, so we tend to think, too, that we have... And we do have separate personalities, and we do have separate thoughts. But those separate thoughts can't be what they are without everything else. So that the separateness 
and wholeness, excuse me, they're appearing simultaneously. They're into being. You can't separate stuff. How are you going to separate it? Okay, so your personality too. Right? You learn this when you're in the forest. Eventually, you start to see that, you know, pretty quickly, all the trees are different. They all have their own personality. And this relates, this is a metaphor for our personality. All those trees have different personality. You take a tree that's growing out in the open, and there's no trees around growing in a big field. It will spread out wide. It will just spread out. And, the, and it won't just shoot up with a big, nice, straight, long trunk, and then the canopy will spread out above. Personality of those trees are shaped by the trees around it, which also have all different personalities shaped by all the other trees around it. Your personality is shaped by all the personalities and everything that's ever happened. You can't take your personality like you can't take an individual thought and pull it out of the universe. Your personality is into being. Even though it is different, it is into being with all the other personalities and is interconnected and interdependent. So it is different and whole at the same time. It is separate and whole at the same time. So when separateness shows up, this whole clinging sometimes to separateness, if you took that whole notion of separateness and tried to pull it away from the universe, you would already find that the whole notion of separateness is whole. You can't pull it. Oh, it's all connected. It's so, so the fear of being separate is already whole. It just doesn't understand that. And it's insisting on being separate. The insisting on being separate is the whole universe showing up. But, but it doesn't want to see that, or else it's going to die. It can't be separate. That's that's a really uh, beautiful way of of talking about it. Mm -hmm. I wonder also, do you know or do you have an inkling of what you are after you die? Like what happens to you after you die? Like are you, I mean, you're this, you're the whole and, and you're separate at the same time. Um, and I often see people talk about it in terms of like, there is just one awareness that uh, is within everything. But then also people talk about individual souls and you, you talk about uh, the Atman and the Brahman are one. Um, but what is your feeling on you and what you are after you die? Like, are you a soul that is part of the whole and separate or are you just the whole, or are you nothing? <laughs> yeah. Let's take, let's uh, again back up. I like backing. Let's take deer in the forest. Remember we were saying that the, the deer is not, the deer is the forest, right? You can't separate the deer from the forest. Like try and take a fish out of the water. Can't separate the fish from the water. You can't separate a human being from the plant or the forest. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, and the fish are part of the forest too. The when the bears eat the fish and fertilize the trees in the mountains and mm -hmm. yeah. So what happens to deer when it dies? It's still the forest, isn't it? Yeah, I, well, it's 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 all of its uh, what makes it all of its parts have been, been become re redistributed. Yeah. So, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh was asked that question. You know, well, not that particular question, but his uh, students were asking him. Uh, they knew he was going to die soon, so they said, Thich Nhat Hanh, you're going to leave us. He says, where am I going to go? It's like the deer in the forest. It's like, where am I going to go? So life is constantly changing form. An interesting way to look at it is water. Say you're a cloud and you identify as a cloud. And then when, when you turn into rain, you feel like I'm dead. But you're still water. But if you're a cloud that understands that, you look at the rain and you look at the brook below and you go, hi me down there. And then the brook enters the ocean. Or where does a wave go when it dies? Back to the ocean. Yeah. So that's as best I can do with that one. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you don't see... The soul there, so there. Is, do you believe that there is a soul at all? Okay, that's that. See, that whole thing gets very controversial, even in non-dual community. Yeah. From what I understand, and I haven't looked into it enough, but from what I understand, there seems to be some non-dual teachers, ancient and current, um, that said there was no capital S self. Uh huh. No soul. Uh, know what some people call Brahman or Buddha mind. Even the Buddhists have uh, some controversy over that. Um, the way, see, because for me, I feel like the lotus is still opening. So the way I used to see it was yeah, you know, for a long time, and we're kind of going back to what we started with. Um, there's something that's not coming and going. It's very still and silent. And everything's happening within it. And that basically is the capital S self. That all fell apart for me at some point because I kept poking at it, poking at it, poking. At it. And this is all irrelevant. What's really relevant, I'll, I'll continue, but what's really relevant is how do we address human conflict? We're not doing that when we ask these questions. But they're interesting questions and they're fun and they're esoteric and all. Um, that fell apart for me. And the coming and going, I could no longer separate from that which was not coming and going. I saw them as mutually arising into being, arising together as they always have and always will be. It's not that one was first and then one, no time. There's no time here. They're mutually arising so that would mean there's no capitalist self. Which 
some people tend to identify with the capital S self. That's a, the one of the, I think, the last identification. But it's not a bad thing. It's not that they should it. It's a beautiful place to be. And it's a place of, of usually peace, a peace of mind. And um, it's it's a it's a good feeling place. Where I find myself now is if I can draw some kind of picture, is that everything has no boundary. There's no boundary. So if it doesn't have a boundary, it's not a thing. Right? It can't be a thing. And that is expressing itself as form or things. And the things are coming and going. And there's no separating them. We're coming back to this. We're going to be keep coming back to this wholeness. We just, I can't get out of it anymore. There's like, I cannot separate a false self and a capital S self. I just can't do that anymore. The, the, the false self is also whole. It's the whole thing appearing impermanently. And the thing is also, it's like for most people who haven't experienced, I mean, I haven't experienced that in a way where I can talk about it from firsthand experience. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people can't. So it it, it can be hard to talk about <laughs> at all. <laughs> all this is because thought can't grasp no time. Uh -huh. Thought is so embedded. Look at the language. Even when we say no time, it, time is embedded in the language, the eternal. Yeah. It all refers back to time. No time or time. Yeah. So the language is so embedded in time we're stuck with the language. But time yeah. is also like our, to me, it seems like a, a fundamental experience of the, of this place is there seems to be some form of, I mean, there's night and day. There's the moon waxing and waning. There's right. seasons. Uh, there's, uh, and we're, we're, we appear to be these, these human beings that were born as a child as a baby and are growing older now i've got little mm -hmm. hairs in my mm -hmm. beard and and yep. death is is a is staring me in the face <laughs> it's 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 there at the end <laughs> yeah okay so i'm going to ask you a question yeah if you didn't have a memory would there be any concept of time well I, I hypothetical questions can be hard because I don't have experience of <laughs> right. I don't have the memory of an experience of not having a memory. So <laughs> I would assume though that probably not, but that also, even if I didn't have a memory or if I had like a, like a, like the memento movie where he, he has like no, no long-term memory storage, um, then there, there that still wouldn't, preclude time from happening the sun is still rising and setting the well moon. that well okay so can we suggest that that's all happening now in the eternal now so are you both musicians no. I'm not so much a musician. I like I like to listen and dance and sing along. Okay. Think about music. Mm -hmm. You only can have one note at a time. Mm -hmm. Why is there harmony if you can't remember? So the reason why there's harmony and movement is because 
you remember the prior notes. And they're all there now. You're, the past notes are still now. They're not in the past. They're being remembered now with the current notes, which is the symphony of life. Okay, so the only reason why we see change is because the past is here now, but it's not back there. It's always eternally now. We just, it, the past is here with us. Mm being us, taking this form and immediately creating another form because our bodies are constantly changing and though we don't perceive it. Yeah. <laughs> so would you say then the future is also here or, or not? Well, there's no place else for it to be. <laughs> Yeah, but it maybe exists only as potential. Yes, potential. And I think an important thing that is one of the most hardest things to get across is as the universe is creating these words and creating you as you sit there. And as the universe looks out through all your experiences, it's going to act. It's you acting. And that's creating, you can't remove yourself from the future. The future will always be different because you exist, because you make choices, not personal choices, but choices that the now appearing as you is making according to all your experiences. So you are created, you are creating. There is intercreating. The future will never be the same because of you and what you do. So we're not just like little robots. We're part of the whole system moving and changing. We can't remove ourselves from the future like we can't remove ourselves from the past. The future will never be other than what it is because we are who we are. That makes a lot of sense. Right. Mm -hmm. But I also, I wonder also about people desiring to know these things directly, to, to see, to have a, an awakening. <laughs> and, and I know that when you even up talking about some experience to acquire, it's not, that's not right, but it is, you know, we have, we have language. We can only speak mm -hmm. through language. So what do you, do you have any recommendations for, for people who are, who, who are seeking and, and want to know for themselves? Do you think it's a folly in general? I like as a whole seeking in general is a folly or are there things that people can do? I don't think seeking is wrong or right. 
I think um, see, I never give advice. I, I, I don't see that's my place. For one thing, all I can do and what I usually do is look for openness in another person. And if I see conflict in the root of it, I might point to it and hope, hoping that the openness in me is connecting with the openness in that person in order for them to see something they haven't seen before. So to me, it's not a matter of advice. It's not advice on how to get from point A to point B because point A and point B are the same place. We just don't understand them. So, what is pursuing awakeness? That energy is already the whole universe showing up as that. But that is insisting on separateness and personal stuff. It's insisting on that. And it's sticking to it and not going to let go. And it's trying to get out of itself is just more self-concern. But we don't want to see that. It just continues itself on the path. The path is a continuation of the notion of a separate self. But that doesn't mean it's bad. The whole universe is showing up as that, right? And at some point, that can get frustrated. And I think some teachers understand that, and they'll just push you and push you on the path and push you and push you and push you. You're going to try harder. You're going to try harder. You're going to try harder. Boy, you know what? You throw up your hand. You're totally frustrated, and you're going like, ah, oh, this is all bullshit. What the hell is going on here? What's the truth? See, then the passion for truth comes in. But it wasn't. You didn't decide to do that. It it came as grace. All of a sudden, like you just threw up your hands, you gave up, and just, okay, so what's the truth here? Is lightning a bunch of bullshit or not? You know, and I don't care whether it is or it isn't. I just want to know what the truth is for once. So we're back to that again. Comes keeps coming down to this. Yeah, I think that's what Richard Rose calls the egoless vector, or at least that's what. Yeah, Mark well, I'm talks not about. familiar with its teachings, so but it sounds right. Yeah, I mean, because I I know for myself, um, my seeking has, <laughs> it, there's there's a very selfish quality to it. There always has been, but it's like uh, it does seem like a, a process that has to burn itself out to be able to. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It can't do anything about itself. See, whenever it tries to do something, it's just self motivated, and it's using that tissue in the brain that's dedicated to that, and it's re it is just making that muscle bigger and more powerful. That's why I don't, I don't like give people advice to do this, do that, do this, do that. I just feel like what I'm doing is, is exercising that part of the brain that is self-concern. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you look at your path, there was an awful lot of, it, it would appear there was a lot of effort 
You know, you had uh, a, a year of celibacy, which you said was the hardest thing you ever did. You um, went, I, I believe I've heard a podcast where you were saying that when you had your awake, this awakening, um, you, it was at a point where you were aware of every thought that, that came up in your mind, that you were that. Well, at that point, well, okay, so, so yes. So most people, most people who have an awakening have done it all. They've tried everything. They've looked into it. They read all the books and boy, the tap people are good for that. They, You guys are part of that. You've read everything. You've done everything, you know, and but Usually those are the people who end up having an awakening, but upon awakening, they realize, oh, that didn't happen because I did X. There definitely seems to be a correlation, though. <laughs> well, you know, um, there may be, but when, at least when, I had my so-called awakening. I realized that it was I could have never done anything to achieve it because everything I tried to do was just reinforcing the sense of separateness. Yeah. And that's what the realization is. If the realization is at that point, gee, everything I've been doing has just been reinforcing this sense of separateness, then you know everything you did didn't bring you, and nobody arrived by, uh, if I may say, because that which wanted to arrive couldn't go to the party. In other words, no one achieves humility. Humility is not achieved. If it's achieved, it can't be humility, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when there's humility, then the self is put in its place. Hmm. And it realizes it's blind, you know, it, it doesn't have the volition it thought it had. Hmm. And it falls on the wayside. But and then, you know, like uh, I've been married three times, and with, when I was with my second wife, um, I was having a conversation like this with her, and she was really digging in. All of a sudden, something happened, and I'm pretty sure she got a glimpse. Her whole face changed. And I, oh, I thought I heard a snap in the room. She pulled back and never, ever would talk to me about this stuff again. Wow. She wasn't going there. She wow. stopped completely. I think she got a glimpse. And, you know, when there's, if there's no self, there's no taking credit and there's no blame. Oh, good. There's no blame. Well, there's no taking credit either. Yeah. There's no feeling proud anymore. There's no sense of pride. There's no sense of I'm on top of the world. Like I used to have when I was the leader of different gangs. Mm -hmm. You give, there's a giving all that up. The whole persona is given up. Except if you get attached to the persona of being an enlightened person, then you're right back in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, uh, this has been a really amazing conversation. I really appreciate you um, being on the show. Um, you have several books that you've written. Uh, the Wild Within is a is a really good one, and then um, what, Tracking in the Art of Seeing is a yeah. That's mostly a field guide to animal tracking. Um, but 
uh, if people want to get a hold of you or yeah, find out what you're up to, how can they do that? They can go, they can find me on my website, paulrezendes.com. Uh, I have a Vimeo site too. They can go to Vimeo, but that's, oh, but there is two videos on there. Most of them are all nature videos, uh, but on Vimeo, I have two videos that are about what does it mean to be awake. And if you just search that on Vimeo, you should be able to find it. You also can search it on YouTube. It's on the TAP Foundation website. Both of those videos are, are there on YouTube, too. What does it mean to be awake? Hey, well, thank you. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, you again, Paul.